Either get a job or get out. I'm sick of supporting a woman like you. My husband's words hit a nerve and something inside me snapped. Why should I put up with someone like this? A man who belittles others to bask in his own superiority. I'm better off without a man like this. My name is Melissa. I'm 36 and I balance work with homemaking. I'm a freelance illustrator working from home. I've always loved art and went to art college. And after graduating, I worked at a design company. When I turned 30, I took the plunge and went independent. I wanted to express myself in the way I like, doing what I love. Back then, I was single and thought I could live life on my own terms. But then I met my husband Daniel through a mutual friend, and we clicked. We decided to get married smoothly and registered a year later. Daniel's company has branches all over the country, and he traveled a lot for his job as a salesman. Because he works long hours, he wanted me to be a housewife, so I temporarily paused my illustrator career. Sure, he works late and travels, so someone has to manage the home. I thought we should support each other as a married couple, so I didn't mind quitting my job. I figured I could resume my art career later while continuing my studies in the meantime. I think so. I loved him, and he loved me. We trusted each other, so there was nothing to complain about. But then, life threw us a curveball. Daniel got promoted to head a new sales office, meaning no more transfers for a while. It was what is commonly known as a promotion. Being in charge meant that I would not be transferred for a while, and we could settle down in that city. Now we could finally settle in one place. We had been moving a lot and were exhausted from adapting to new places every year or so. But now we could finally settle down in one town, and we were both happy about it. Before, I was so busy supporting my husband that I couldn't think of anything else. But I thought things would be different from now on. Going back to work seemed within reach, but it didn't go as smoothly as I hoped. My husband was still swamped with work, handling the transition and launching new branches. Then another issue came up. The cost of rent in our new city was higher than we expected. We could get by on my husband's salary, but just barely. And his company didn't offer housing assistance, so we had to cover it all ourselves. We wanted to save for the future, but his salary was barely covering living expenses. I considered dipping into our savings if needed, but it didn't feel secure. So I asked my husband, Would it be okay if I worked too, provided I manage the house well? He looked hesitant and finally said, Fine, but make sure you take care of the home. His choice of words felt off, but I've always supported him as a housewife. I thought he must also feel uneasy about the lifestyle changes. I decided not to dwell on it. I finally have a job I like. I was excited to go back to work after all these years. But my husband started to change, and not for the better. What's the deal with this dinner? It's roast chicken, steamed vegetables, chowder, and fruit. This food sucks. Why are you cutting corners when you're home all day? He started to nitpick the meals I prepared, something he never did before. This food is like hospital meals. It's not building up any strength. That's not true. I found some deals on ingredients so I made a main dish and a side you like. Hearing that, he shouted, What? Are you saying my salary is too low? I felt stunned by his sudden outburst. Why was he twisting my words like that? His angers left me speechless. Do you have any idea how hard I work to support you? Just when I get promoted and things are looking up. Don't mess it up by doing something unnecessary. I wanted to argue back, to catch my breath and think before speaking, but I stopped myself. My husband must be going through a hard time right now. He's swamped with the stress of being the one in charge and the responsibility to protect our family. I'm sorry. I apologize. He must just be tired, I convinced myself. Still, his domineering attitude continued. Hey, are you slacking on cleaning the bathroom? Where's the shirt I was going to wear today? At least shine my shoes. He never acted like this before we moved. What happened to him? It's like he became a different person, constantly yelling and shouting. Day by day, my distrust for him grew. Balancing housework and my job was harder than I thought. I wanted to sneak in work between house chores, but if I tried to make everything perfect to his standards, housework alone would consume my day. If I tried to meet the deadlines set by my clients, the spare moments I had for chores were nowhere near enough. I've also started working, you know. Can't you help a bit with the chores? I suggested, but he retorted. 
It's because you're busy with your worthless job that the housework is suffering. Just quit. Don't get cocky just because you work from home. You're not even making much. And you, acting so high and mighty even though you're just a housewife. Being disparaged as just a housewife became his go-to insult. According to him, I was still a housewife, even if I was working. What twisted logic. I didn't get it. I wasn't making much, that's true. But that's because he kept disrupting me, making it impossible to increase my workload. Fed up, I minimized the chores I did for him and started prioritizing my work. And then, he started looking even more visibly displeased. The rift between us continued to grow. Then one day, while cleaning the room, I stumbled upon his pay stub. So careless to leave it lying around, the pay stub was carelessly placed on the desk. I was somewhat curious and picked it up. I knew his salary, of course, but I had never seen the pay stub before. Curiosity got the best of me, and I was shocked when I looked inside. When I checked the amount on the pay stub, it was about half of what I'd been told before. What's going on? I receive monthly living expenses and rent from my husband, and the rest is his pocket money. Where is my husband getting the missing amount from? Wasn't he supposed to have gotten a promotion? How can his salary drop like this? Since when? I searched for other statements but couldn't find any pay stubs from before his promotion. What's really happening here? At that moment, my vague distrust towards my husband turned into certainty. We can't live on this amount. What is he thinking? Why did he keep this so critical from me? Why didn't he tell me his salary had gone down? Just as I was gathering the pay stubs to confront him, the phone rang. It was from my husband's uncle, whom I'd only met a few times. Uncle? Long time no see. What's up? Well, it's awkward to bring it up, but you see, I've lent him some money. It's been a while, and I'm wondering when I'll get it back. I'm in a bind over here. What? He owes you money? Then it clicked. My husband had been filling in the gap in his salary with loans from his uncle. Turns out, we're talking in the tens of thousands. I sincerely apologized to his uncle and promised to repay him. Even though I felt terrible, the uncle didn't blame us and kindly said, Just pay it back when you can. I've reached my limit. That night, I didn't mention the debts or the pay stubs, but my anger towards my husband slowly and steadily rose. He's belittled me for being a housewife, exploited me around the house, and even interfered with my work. That night was no different. He continued to berate me. When will you ever get good at household chores? The food's terrible. The entryway's a mess. What have you been doing at home? Another useless job, I bet. Being a housewife must be easy. Doesn't he realize his words contradict themselves? I cook and clean just like anyone else. If you're not happy, then why don't you do it? You've been coming home on time lately. You can handle it. When I pushed back, my husband slammed his fist on the table. You! When did you become such a mouthy woman? Don't get carried away, you waste of money! Do you even know who's providing for you? I didn't back down. What's so mouthy about standing up for myself? I'm doing my part. What about you? I glared at him. I don't have to put up with this man anymore. Whatever he says, I don't care anymore. I spoke my mind. He didn't back down either. You pretend to be working around the house, but never actually do. Start earning, then talk. I thought the same could be said for him, but I remained silent. Should have never married you. What a money pit you've turned out to be. You keep saying, we don't have money, so why don't you earn some? If you're not going to work, get out. I'm tired of supporting a woman like you. He looked at me triumphantly. It sent a shiver down my spine. He must have thought I'd apologize, but I was ready. Fine, I'll leave. I grabbed my already packed bags and started to head out. You can't do anything on your own anyway. Why do you think that? I gave him a cold look. By the way, I'm leaving this. I've already filled it out. I slapped the divorce papers I got from the city hall onto the table. He must have never expected I'd leave, let alone file for divorce. He was speechless, standing still. Well, that settles it. Make sure you fill it out and send it soon. I left our home and headed to my parents, where I had already informed them of the situation. They welcomed me warmly. My husband's sudden change of attitude, the income being way less than he claimed, and the fact he was in debt? Hearing this, my parents urged me to divorce him immediately. I intended to, of course. 
But would he even fill out those divorce papers? Dad said he'd introduce me to a lawyer if I couldn't get a divorce. I thanked him for his reassuring words, hoping that I could end my marriage as soon as possible. A week after I left home, my husband showed up at my parents' house. Did you fill out the divorce papers? Sorry, I... I asked if you filled them out. Please, can you reconsider the divorce? I was a bit taken aback. He didn't seem like the arrogant man I knew. Though my parents looked at him skeptically, they agreed we should at least talk. So they invited him in. Turns out I never got promoted. His promotion was a complete lie. He was actually reassigned to a subsidiary, a kind of demotion, and that's why his salary decreased. It seems he's never been particularly good at his job. I had sensed he wasn't too competent, but I had no idea it was this bad. Apparently, his transfers and job changes had always been a result of his inability to work well, making him the office's hot potato. Now, he was stuck in an insignificant department in the subsidiary, a place from which promotions were virtually impossible and where people often got pushed out. My husband always had high pride. I guess that's why he couldn't tell me the truth and pretended to get a promotion. After losing his standing at work, he started to inflate his ego at home, believing he was superior because he was providing for a housewife like you. He would belittle me and sabotage my work just to sustain his pride. I took your absence to realize that you were earning quite a bit. Before leaving, I deliberately left a copy of my bank statement in his room. Though I earned less than he did, it was still a substantial amount to support our living. I realized I need you. I can't even afford the rent on my own. I think we can make it work if we combine our strengths again. So let's give it another try. I want to spend my life with you. I won't make you suffer anymore. Tears formed in his eyes. Feeling completely indifferent, I brushed him off. If you can't afford the rent, then just move. You can find cheaper places if you're alone. And what about your uncle's debt? You have to pay it back, right? When I said that, his eyes widened. How did you know? He was still trying to hide his debts and start over. You just can't reason with some people. I get that you are making ends meet by borrowing from your uncle, but if we're talking about starting over, shouldn't you lay all the cards on the table? My dad chimed in after I spoke. You've been so dishonest. I can't imagine letting you have custody of our daughter anymore. What were you planning to do about the debt without telling her? My husband didn't say a word at my dad's comment. I continued, pressing the issue. If you won't agree to the divorce, I'll hire a lawyer. Your abusive comments are clearly grounds for a divorce, and I have evidence. So brace yourself. My husband seemed to give in and pulled out the divorce papers from his bag. I've really messed up. Beyond repair. It's too late now. We're strangers. I took the divorce papers from my husband. We hardly had any shared assets just a small amount of savings that we split. We moved out of the apartment we had lived in as a couple, and I heard he quit his job. Apparently, the rumor of our divorce spread at his already uncomfortable workplace, making it even more unbearable for him. He said he's been paying back his debt to his uncle slowly, while working part-time. After the divorce, he reached out several times. I want to start over with you. Nothing's been going well since we split. I realized you were the only one on my side. Can we? I got creeped out by his constant pleas for reconciliation and changed my phone number. If he had just put his pride aside and been honest, maybe we could have understood each other as a couple. There's no way I'm forgiving his abusive behavior, and the love has long since faded. I silently walked away from him. Afterward, I resumed my career as an illustrator in earnest. I'm busy, but every day is so fulfilling. A bright future waits for the newly free me. Right now, my job feels like my lover. Who would have thought that that moment of courage and decision would change my life so much? It's my one and only life. I'll live each day to the fullest, with no regrets. I looked away from my computer screen and gazed out the window, thinking just that. I'm sorry for serving you something that didn't taste good. I promise I won't make it again. Oh. No matter what I made, he always criticized it. I reached my breaking point. I decided to divorce and 
leave the house. Then, something unexpected happened with my husband and our eldest son. When a woman gets married, she's often not called by her first name anymore. My name is Emma, but at work and in the neighborhood, I'm known as Mrs. Taylor. Even at the daycare and school, they call me that. I would be okay if my husband called me by my first name, but he only refers to me as hey or you. From the beginning of our marriage and even now at 50, I have always called him Gordon. But it seems he doesn't get the hint. Gordon is three years older than me, making him 53. He works for a transportation company and used to deliver goods to the deli where I work. The friendly Gordon started chatting with me, a store clerk, and we became close. Our meeting was quite romantic, but married life wasn't like a fairy tale. Gordon, using work as an excuse, never helped with household chores. Even though I'm a full-time worker at the deli, it's not like I'm a stay-at-home mom. We had our eldest son Mark, but Gordon hardly ever helped raise him. Men get praised just for playing catch with their kids, but women work from dawn till dusk and still aren't exempt from household duties, nor do they get any praise. Isn't society's expectation that mothers should naturally take care of their children oppressive to women? Mark was a good kid until high school. But after joining the workforce, he became sarcastic, especially in the last two years since he joined his current company. He's been coming home late and doesn't listen to me at all. But for some reason, he and Gordon get along really well. Sometimes they even mock me together. Mark, what kind of job are you doing right now? I work for an ID company. There are many types of ID companies, right? Why bother explaining? You wouldn't get it anyway. With a smirk, he seemed annoyed to talk with me. Maybe at 25, Mark doesn't feel like explaining his job in detail to his mom. Sometimes I get so mad at him it scares me. Am I lacking maternal instincts? There's a term called unconditional love. When Mark was a baby, I felt that intense love for him. Looking at his cute sleeping face, I felt I could do anything for him, but now, seeing the sarcastic man Mark has become, my unconditional love wavers. I find myself expecting something in return for the love I give, both from Gordon and Mark. 26 years of marriage, every day is filled with sighs, and I can't say I have been happy. About two years ago, Gordon and Mark started teaming up to criticize my cooking. I don't think my cooking skills suddenly dropped and I don't remember cutting corners. I always consider nutritional balance, try to save every penny at the supermarket and take into account Gordon and Mark's favorite dishes. Planning daily meals is hard enough but having my hard work criticized is honestly disheartening. Tonight, I made Gordon's favorite Chinese stir-fry. I thought he would be pleased but Gordon yelled, what is this? Uh, is it not good? It's too salty. You said it was too bland yesterday. Then Gordon pointed at me accusingly. Can't you find a middle ground? It's always one extreme or the other with you. Yet, he continued to eat voraciously, exaggeratingly leaning back and shouting, So salty. Mark just ate silently. How about you, Mark? I often get taken to fancy restaurants in Akasaka and Ginza by my boss. So, I have become a gourmet. Everything tastes good to me now. I worry for the woman who might marry such a sarcastic man, even if he is my own son. While still complaining about the saltiness, Gordon finished his meal and in the end, so did Mark. Feeling stressed, I decided to grab a meal with my best friend, Juliet, on my day off. Juliet, like me, is 50. She went through a divorce two years ago. Her husband never lifted a finger around the house but had the nerve to point out a dirty window and some dust. Juliet lost it. She told me she whacked him on the head with a hanger. Talk about gutsy. When I brought up Gordon and Mark, Juliet got mad as if it was about her. Why don't you just tell him to cook for himself and hit him with a frying pan? I can't say that if I did, he would just get stubborn and insist on cooking. He would probably realize how hot cooking is if he tried it himself. 
I wouldn't dare eat anything Gordon cooked. Juliet laughed heartily, but for me, it's a real concern. Ever since I became single, I have been quite popular at work. It's your life, you know. You are living just for your husband or kids. You're only 50, Emma. I'm already 50. Don't give up because of age. 50 is when life truly begins. I get asked out for dinner by male colleagues quite often. It's probably because I'm single now. If the guy is single too, there's no issue. Juliet looked to Radian. Her confidence and positivity were blinding. Is the ideal mother and wife someone who puts her kids first? Husband second and herself last, is that right? Whether it's right or not, society's norms aren't always correct. Before being a mother or a wife, you are an individual. Life's more fun when you live for yourself. I was taken aback. You're intense, Juliet. Don't call me intense. I'm just normal. Dinner time is always tense for me. In most households, dinner time is a moment of family bonding and happiness. Tonight, I made Mark's favorite, curry rice. But after one bite, Gordon shouted, What the heck is this? Is it bad? It's sweet. Way too sweet. Who makes sweet curry? Trying to hold back my disappointment, I asked Mark, is it too sweet? Uh, I prefer spicy or medium spicy, but more importantly, I know this amazing curry place. I mean, it's not fair to compare a home cook to a Michelin star chef. I don't cook just to hear Gordon's harsh words and Mark's sarcastic comments. Without considering my feelings, Gordon sighed. Oh, my mom's curry rice was the best, just like home. I wanted to tell him to have his mother cook for him every day, but I was afraid of escalating the argument, so I held back. At work, while I was assisting a customer, my manager, Mr. Smith, complimented me. Mrs. Taylor, your customer service is always so cheerful and genuine. It's great. Really? Thank you so much. Words have power. Even a single compliment can lift your spirits. Customer service is crucial. If the staff is pleasant, customers will want to return. Even though each deli claims to have its unique offerings, they all seem to sell similar items. Naturally, if the prices are the same, people would prefer the store with better customer service. Mr. Smith is 54 and single. He doesn't seem to be divorced, nor does he appear to be against marriage. Standing tall at six feet, he's a dandy gentleman and quite the charmer, especially among the younger female staff. Being single in your 50s doesn't mean you're not attractive. Maybe his standards are sky high or perhaps he had a passionate love affair when he was younger and can forget it. His mysterious aura probably fuels the rumors, making him even more intriguing to the ladies. Mr. Smith treats me, a 50-year-old, with the same kindness he shows to the women in their 20s. Such a gentleman. I can't help but wonder how Gordon and Mark behave at work. If Mark makes snide remarks to his colleagues like he does at home, he would definitely be disliked. I worry about Gordon, especially when it comes to bullying subordinates or harassing female colleagues. I just hope he never gets arrested. During the dreaded dinner time, Gordon and Mark were watching TV. It was a show where family restaurant staff showcased their best dishes judged by renowned chefs. As I casually watched, Gordon chimed in. Don't you ever think of going on this show? Why? Would you fail everyone? Mark joined in, laughing at his father's joke. They would probably say, are you trying to kill me with this and throw a rejection card at you? That's just too much. So, uh, should we order pizza tonight? Pizza? I'm in the mood for a hamburger steak. Take out from the family restaurant? Seeing my rare defiance, Gordon's expression changed. What's with the attitude? Even I have my limits, you know? Mark laughed along with his father. I'll sing I want you back in full chorus. I wasn't amused. What's uh, I want you back? Don't you know anything? They can have their fun. I felt left out and lonely. Juliet's face came to mind and the word divorce crossed my thoughts. It was in the evening after work, Mr. Smith called me over. Emma? Huh? Sorry, uh, Mrs. Taylor. I smiled at him. If you want to call me that, it's fine. Oh, uh, really? 
a forgotten thrill. For a moment, a love song played in the background of my mind, but I quickly dismissed it. Life isn't that sweet. It rarely goes as planned. There are several young, attractive female staff in their 20s. I'm probably not even on his radar. As expected, Mr. Smith wanted to discuss work, not dinner. Actually, uh, there's talk of our store making a TV appearance. On TV? It's a show where family restaurants and delis showcase their signature dishes and a uh, chief judges them. Uh, I know it. My husband and son watch it regularly. The theme is lunch combos and there will be an internal tasting session. This session will determine who represents the store on TV. We're uh, thinking of having you, Emma, represent us. I was taken aback and immediately declined. My husband and son criticize my cooking every day. Mr. Smith pondered for a moment. Do they leave food on their plates? No, uh, they always finish it. I have a friend who, no matter how good the restaurant, always says, you're satisfied with this? I know better places. Really? Maybe Gordon and Mark are like that. We need someone like you who cooks daily. Would you consider creating a menu for us? The responsibility is immense and I like confidence, but part of me wants to try. I want feedback from people other than Gordon and Mark. I took the challenge seriously and crafted a lunch combo. The company's top executives tasted it and unanimously approved my dish. While my colleagues were thrilled, I felt a mix of shock and resentment towards Gordon and Mark. Despite their daily criticisms, everyone else loved my dish. I can't understand why they would belittle my cooking. Was it just for fun? Furious, I left work early and stopped by the city office. I didn't tell Gordon and Mark about my selection for the TV show. Tonight's dish was shrimp scampi. For some reason, there were two cards on the table labeled pass and fail. Did they make these? After tasting a shrimp, Gordon and Mark exchanged glances and simultaneously raised the fail card. This is clearly a miss. I'm disappointed in this shrimp. Are they pretending to be judges? Is it fun to mock someone? I grabbed the cards and confronted them. You fail as a husband. What are you trying to do? You fail as a son. Me too? I glared at them then lowered my head. I'm sorry for serving you bad food. I won't do it again. What? I have reached my limit with their constant negativity. I place divorce papers on the table. I'm filing for a divorce. Wait, wait, wait. I won't wait. I have waited for 25 years. I can't wait any longer. 25 years? Okay, maybe not 25 years, but for the past few years, I've been patient. I can't take it anymore. I am leaving this house. Gordon in shock tried to laugh it off. It's Candid Camera, right? That's an old reference. Where is it in camera? As he pretended to search, Mark warned him, Dad, she seems serious. Really? Of course, I am. Congratulations. You won't have to eat bad food anymore. A whirlwind of change, I quickly moved out and started living on my own. Juliet's support was invaluable. Without the burden of my foolish husband and clueless son, I could focus on my job. Perhaps when life changes, many things start to shift. The company asked me to appear on TV. No way, I can't do TV. You should get someone younger and prettier. That's how TV works. Most people only get one shot at TV in their lifetime. While part of me wanted to do it, I was worried about how I would look on screen. The show will have the chief judge ask detailed questions about the dish. If it's not the person who made it, they won't be able to answer. I see. Convinced by Mr. Smith, and the executives, I agreed to the TV appearance. I didn't tell Gordon and Mark. I have blocked their calls, so they can't reach me. And I have no intention of reaching out. Of course, I told Juliet about the TV appearance. She was shocked and said, I want to be on it too, with teary eyes. I appeared on TV with Mr. Smith. It was my first time and my heart raced with nervousness. Watching the stern-faced chef silently eat my lunch combo, I felt like apologizing before the judgment. This uh, bolognese has Worcestershire sauce, ketchup, and instant coffee. 
I see. Finally, judgment time, I prayed. As the judges unanimously raised the pass card, they even praised it as delicious and perfect. I high-fived Mr. Smith blushing. I hoped it wasn't a dream. After that, I got involved in product development and received a raise. Was it luck that things turned around after escaping from a rude husband and a sarcastic son? Three months after the divorce, Mark visited the store. He had bulked up like a football player which surprised me. What happened to you? I haven't been eating at home, so I've been eating out a lot. Before I knew it, I looked like this. Serves him right. It's probably karma for mocking the food that a top chef praised. I saw you on TV. Dad was shouting in disbelief. Mark smiled, but I only replied, uh, oh. Please come back, mom. Grow up, you're 25, handle it yourself. Can I at least live with you if you don't want to be with dad? Be independent, don't come here again. I spoke coldly and Mark, seemingly shocked by my firmness, left. The next day, as I was placing an umbrella stand outside the store, a massive man approached. Emma, who are you? Don't play dumb. It was Gordon, but he had gained a significant amount of weight. Because of you, I've been eating and drinking at pubs every day. Before I knew it, I couldn't move. You have no right to call me that anymore. Gordon tried to laugh it off. Emma, please come back at this rate. Mark and I will turn into Crusher Blackwell. Crusher what? You don't know who Crusher Blackwell? He was a 215 kilo wrestler. His jokes showed no remorse. I don't want to waste my time talking to you. Please leave. Despite my harsh words, Gordon persisted. I apologize for everything, truly. Even as he apologized, I remained silent. Your cooking was always amazing. My mother told me never to praise someone too much. If you keep saying something's delicious, they won't improve. Wait, where are you going? Before Gordon could finish his apology, I had already retreated into the store. But to my surprise, he followed me in. Wait, we were in the middle of a conversation. I have nothing more to say. If you persist, I'll call the police. The police? Gordon dramatically looked around, then back at me. Why bring the police into a marital issue? We're not married anymore. Just give me one more chance. Please leave. Suddenly, Mr. Smith emerged from the back. I've called the police. Maybe you should leave. Who are you? I'm the manager of the store. Why are you intervening in a marital dispute? We are not a couple. Gordon, with his exaggerated gestures, pointed at Mr. Smith and me. I get it now. Is that why you divorce? Are you two together? Enough. His rude insinuation infuriated me. What nonsense are you spouting? I won't tolerate it. Is it true? Is that why you're so upset? Just then, a police car pulled up and two sturdy officers entered. That's the man. What are you talking about? As one officer tried to restrain Gordon, he resisted. Let me go. She's my wife. I don't know this giant. So you're denying me now? One officer said, We'll discuss this at the station. The other officer was also thrown off. Had Gordon become so strong as a wrestler? Overwhelmed by jealousy, Gordon's face twisted into a terrifying scowl as he grabbed one of the store's umbrellas. I was taken aback, but Mr. Smith bravely stepped in front of me, arms outstretched. Trying to play the knight, are you showing your true colors, you homewrecker? As Gordon raised the umbrella to strike, an officer from behind forcefully knocked it out of his hand and grabbed Gordon's wrist. You're under arrest for obstructing official duties. Ugh, obstructing official duties? The police's signature move? You think that solves everything? Just come with us. Emma, Emma, help! Everyone on the street was watching. I felt my face burning with embarrassment. The commotion continued as Gordon was forced into the police car. How embarrassing. Are you okay? I'm fine. Thank you. If you ever need help, just let me know. Such comforting words. You're very kind. I'm not kind to everyone. Huh? Mr. Smith left after dropping that ambiguous line. Maybe it wasn't a misunderstanding. Since then, neither Gordon nor Mark visited the store. I finally had peace. After 26 years of marriage, I was free. 
I could have lunch with Juliet whenever I wanted and enjoy dinners. Even returning to a dark apartment, I never felt lonely. Work was fulfilling and being valued by the company felt great. One day, Mr. Smith approached me. Emma, uh, do you like uh, musicals? Musicals? I got two tickets. It's easy to watch a movie anytime, but a play has a fixed date. I noticed he was sweating. Memories of my youth resurfaced and my heart raced. Maybe it wasn't a misunderstanding after all. I love musicals. I would love to go. Go great. I'll take the tickets and go with a friend. What? Just kidding. How about a nice dinner afterwards? Seeing Mr. Smith's relieved expression, I smiled. Life is unpredictable. Now, I am embarking on a second youth. What is this? Only for Taylor? How could she be so cruel? With a loud slam on the table, father-in-law, his face red with anger, yelled at me. The table was adorned with lavish dishes. Yep. Right in front of my mother-in-law was just a single cup of instant noodles. Until a moment ago, she had stared at it in disbelief. Now, she covered her face, appearing as if she was breaking down in tears. But I saw it. Underneath her hand, she had a sly grin. Seeing father-in-law on her side, she probably thought the situation was turning in her favor. But it wasn't going to be that easy. This instant noodle was just the beginning of our revenge. My name is Eva. I've been married to Robbie for five years. We had a first daughter last year and now I'm a stay-at-home mom. We started living with my in-laws right after our daughter was born. Back then, we live in company housing. But Robbie was transferred by his company. The new location was near Robbie's childhood home. Hearing this, Robbie's parents were thrilled and began preparations for us to move in. They renovated their aging home, even preparing a room for the baby. It was hard to say no after all that. Sorry, Eva. Mom got a bit too excited. Yeah, after all they've done, it's hard to refuse. But you're at home during the day, right? Just you and mom. Won't it be uncomfortable? The renovation was their idea. But they made a room for Jenna. And they said they'd help with her. That's a big help. Robbie seemed unsure till the end. But we eventually decided to live with his parents. However, living with the in-laws wasn't easy. Especially my mother-in-law. Who seemed to have hope for a grandson. She seemed to resent me for having a girl. She constantly made snide remarks about my housework and parenting. The worst was her comments about my cooking. What's with this plant food, Eva? It looks bad. Have you been feeding Robbie this? Uh, well, Robbie said he liked it. Oh, Robbie's just being polite. I can't eat this. Clean it up. You, you're not eating it? No. I don't like food made by someone like you. And she'd leave the food untouched. No matter how I adjusted the seasoning, she'd taste a bit and say, Still not good. Eva, is your taste off? Serving this to your mother-in-law? Even fast food or instant noodles are better. And she'd leave it. Lately, she'd bring home burgers and fries and eat them ostentatiously next to my dishes. It was clear she had no intention of eating my food. If she wasn't going to eat it, why should I prepare her portion? The day I left her spot empty, she was even worse. Why is there no food for me? She's shrieked. Well, you always say you don't like my cooking and eat something else. So I thought, unbelievable. Just because I eat something different, you treat me like this? This is too much. She covered her face, sobbing dramatically. Wait, please. It's just that you always saw your saying it's my fault? She's acting like a tantrum drawing child. My daughter, who was already at the table, sensed the tense atmosphere and began to cry. 
This is a mess. Quickly prepared a meal for my mother-in-law and placed it in front of her, who was still complaining. I can't believe this. What on earth were you thinking? Wanted to say those words were mine, but I held back. I felt it was pointless to confront her directly. That night, I discussed my mother-in-law's behavior with my husband, Robbie. Both Robbie and father-in-law leave early for work and return late, so they're unaware of the weekday meals. But mom did that? But she's not like that on weekends. She doesn't complain on weekends, probably because you and father-in-law are around. I said. Robbie looked puzzled. I understood his disbelief. No one wants to think their mother would treat their wife that way. I had hoped that by keeping quiet, things would stay calm. But today's outburst was the last straw. And now, her snide remarks were not just directed at me, but also at her daughter. If I was cleaning, she'd follow me around saying, Eva, you're so careless. It's a shame for the house after the renovation. When I showered with my daughter, she'd scold from the dressing room. Don't be so loud. It's unladylike for a girl to be noisy. Who did she get that from? When she told my daughter, Jenna is cute. But it would have been better if you were a boy. I was horrified. I could handle her comments about me. But I feared my daughter would be her next target. When I thought about it, I couldn't stand still. Tears in my eyes, I told Robbie everything. He seemed concerned and said, Okay, I'll talk to mom. Those words made me breathe a sigh of relief. I hoped that, as her son, he could make her reflect on her behavior. Once you come down, you will realize that you are doing something outrageous. After feeling relieved, I suddenly felt doubt rising inside me. But a doubt crept in. Would she really reflect? After all, she told a small child with a smile that it would have been better if she were a boy. Then, maybe mom will. Eva, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Can you help? Yeah. I was against leaving together from the start. As Robbie spoke, I took out my phone and started searching. Eva! There's laundry piling up! Are you just trying to get Robbie on your side and neglecting the housework? As expected, Robbie's warning had no effect. With Robbie and father-in-law around, she acted even kinder. But when they weren't, she was even harsher. Hearing her shrill voice, Jenna, who had just fallen asleep, began to cry. Even hearing the crying, my mother-in-law just frowned, showing no guilt. So noisy for a girl. It's because you always coddle her, Eva. Don't speak ill of Jenna. I'm not. I'm just saying it would have been cuter if she were a boy. You're overreacting. She smirked and approached the crib. Don't waste Robbie's money on these gadgets. Girls grow up fine without them. She said, knocking over the baby monitor. Fell, narrowly missing Jenna's face. As I rushed to check on Jenna, my mother-in-law laughed. Oh, and next week is Dad's birthday. Are you prepared? We're inviting his colleagues, so don't embarrass us. Though, your cooking is worse than instant noodles. She laughed loudly and left the living room. Holding my daughter, I could only comfort her. It's okay. Don't cry. It was scary. I won't forgive her. I'll get my revenge side. However... A burning desire for revenge against my mother-in-law raged. A few days later, as she had mentioned, father-in-law's birthday arrived. In their family, they had a tradition of hosting a small home party for father-in-law's birthday every year. This year, upon hearing about it, father-in-law's subordinate said, Please let us celebrate too! And was invited. Of course, 
the usual relatives would also attend. It's easy for father-in-law to just invite people, but I wish he'd consider the one who has to prepare everything. I had to clean and tidy up the living room, which would be the party venue, and prepare meals for over 10 people. Of course, there was no chance my mother-in-law would help. She just stood behind me giving orders without lifting a finger. Even when Robbie offered to help, saying, Mom, Eva, should I help with something? She dismissed him, saying, Oh, no, Robbie, you don't have to do anything. And then add, Eva is so good at winning Robbie over, making him do housework. Aren't you ashamed as a wife? As the relatives and father-in-law subordinates began to arrive, she quickly left the kitchen. I overheard her boasting, Isn't our house lovely? It's always clean. I can hear people saying things like, No, that's not true. I just clean my house properly. I'm the one who cleans it. With anger boiling inside, I continued preparing the food. And a few minutes later, all the guests had arrived and were seated, waiting for the food. My mother-in-law, of course, took the seat next to father-in-law, chatting away as if the food would magically appear. When I entered the living room with the dishes, there was a chorus of admiration. It looks delicious! So stylish! My mother-in-law, ever the opportunist, said, Right? Well, I made the two. I silently set the dishes on the table. I placed the main dishes in the center and side dishes in front of each guest. And finally, I placed an instant ramen in front of my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law's eyes, covered in makeup, blinked repeatedly. She blinked in disbelief, looking between me and the instant ramen. Eva? Please enjoy, I said. What's the meaning of... The lively atmosphere was instantly silenced. The relatives and father-in-law subordinates sensed the tension. What's going on here? Father-in-law was the first to shout. Eva! Serving Taylor instant ramen? Explain yourself! Slammed his fist on the table. But I didn't flinch. She always said my cooking was worse than instant ramen, so I serve her just that. She'd never say that. How dare you treat your mother-in-law this way? No matter how loudly he shouted, I remained calm. Father-in-law, now frustrated, pointed at Robbie. Robbie! This is because of your poor upbringing. Get rid of that awful woman now! But Robbie coldly replied, Fine, then I'll cut ties with you all. What? What do you mean? If you can still say kick Eva out after seeing this, then it's mom who should be kicked out. Robbie showed father-in-law his phone. On the screen was my mother-in-law, laughing as she knocked over the baby monitor. From the phone speaker, her recorded voice echoed. Your cooking is trash. Even instant ramen is better. My mother-in-law's face, which had been downcast as if she were the victim, visibly paled upon hearing the recording. She must have thought father-in-law would side with her and help her navigate the situation. But that wasn't the case. Robbie played multiple recordings from the baby monitor, showcasing her numerous hurtful words and actions. Initially, she tried to avoid eye contact, but soon realized everyone's gaze was fixed on her. In desperation, she lunged for Robbie's phone, losing her balance and face planting into one of the dishes I had prepared. It's... it's a fabrication! Eva's lies! She screamed. Her face smeared with makeup and sauce. But her voice was unmistakably the same as the one coming from the phone. All the guests looked at the mother-in-law with disdain, as there was no way to escape the situation. The guests looked at her with disdain, and father-in-law was in shock. Taylor! You! It's not true! It's not! No matter how much she protested, no one defended her. 
Robby stood up and came to my side. We're leaving this house, he declared, and we left the living room. We could still hear her incomprehensible screams, but we never looked back. Soon after, we left their house with our pre-packed bags. Everything that happened was a plan Robbie and I had devised. When Robbie learned of her harassment, he had consulted father-in-law, who refused to acknowledge his wife's behavior. We feared that without undeniable evidence, we'd be forced to continue living with them. So, Robbie devised a plan to expose her in a way she couldn't deny. The baby monitor and enduring her verbal abuse were all part of it. After moving to our new home, father-in-law reached out to apologize. He apparently divorced her after the incident. In front of his relatives and subordinates, his wife's disgusting behavior was revealed. And father-in-law even made a comment to cover it up. Robbie thought that they would have lost face if they didn't get a divorce. We don't know how she's managing now. But she tried to approach Robbie at his workplace, not knowing our new address. She was reported as a suspicious person and taken by the police. Father-in-law said that she should forgive him because she had thrown out her mother-in-law. But she said, What are you going to do? For me, it was the time when I consulted her about Eva. So to be honest, I think we can just ignore it like this. Um, I don't mean right away. That's right. I'll let him remind me for a while. And so, we haven't been in touch for a while now. Maybe in the future, we'll let him see our child. For now, we want to enjoy our time as family of three. Robbie admitted that he had been too focused on work since the transfer and hadn't been there for Jenna and me. Since moving... He's been taking days off to spend with us. We're looking forward to a peaceful life together in our new environment. My name is Christiana. I'm a 36-year-old housewife juggling part-time work and raising two kids. Life's generally good, but I often find myself frustrated with my husband Billy who's the same age and works a corporate job. For some reason, Billy always seems to prioritize his mother over our family. If she asks him to help her with her garden on a weekend we had plans, he will change them in a heartbeat. Even on days we were supposed to visit my parents, he would suddenly decide to go shopping with his mom instead. For our child's birthday, he rejected the character cake our kid chose, opting for a fruit tart his mom said was delicious. She said kids need to eat lots of fruits to get their vitamins. He would argue. I would often confront him later especially when I saw our disappointed child's face. His mother might seem like a loving grandma who adores her son and grandkids, but she clearly enjoys the attention and superiority she feels when Billy prioritizes her. Even if it means our child gets hurt, she would just smile and say, Sorry, dear, grandma's fault. She sometimes acts condescending towards me, making it hard to hear others praise her as a good mother-in-law. Ever since his father passed away, Billy has been spoiling his mother even more and her attitude has only grown. Amidst all this, our 10th wedding anniversary was approaching. How about a nice dinner and a restaurant for our 10th anniversary? We can leave the kids with your mom or my parents, I suggested. Sounds good. Uh, let's book a fancy place. Remember that restaurant that was on TV? We decided on a high-end restaurant we wouldn't typically visit. Billy seemed excited and quickly called his mom to watch the kids. I was looking forward to our special day, even though it was still two months away. On our anniversary, I was getting nervous. Billy, who promised to come straight home from work, was nowhere to be seen. I kept thinking he might have gotten held up, or maybe he forgot, but he did mention it in the morning. I couldn't reach him or his mother. Who was supposed to watch the kids? In desperation, I called his office. A woman answered and quickly told me he had already left. I thanked her and hung up, wondering why he couldn't just call. 
Our kids who knew about our plans kept glancing at the clock clearly worried. I couldn't take my eyes off the ticking clock. The person who answered the phone right before I called the company earlier should be able to come home already since I went there by bicycle this morning. In this way, I continue to wait for Billy until the very last minute, but it's already at its limit. Our reservation was for 7 p.m. and it was almost time. I called the restaurant to inform them we would be late. Your party is already here, the hostess said. Um, by himself? As I mentioned earlier, you're already seated with your guest, the hostess said. Um, who came with him? A man in business attire and an older woman. Excuse me, but are you? I quickly replied. My mistakes, sorry, and hung up. An older woman? Could it be? I immediately called Billy. When he finally answered, he sounded quite annoyed. What? You've been calling non-stop. Where are you? You're not at the restaurant, are you? Yeah, I'm here. Mom really wanted to eat at this place, so I decided to dine with her tonight. We can celebrate our anniversary at that family diner over the weekend. You love their baked rice dish, right? It was indeed his mother. Knowing it was our anniversary dinner and still joining him was audacious of her, but Billy, who took my seat without a word, made me feel more than anger. It was disgust. And to think he knew how much I had been looking forward to this for the past two months, suggesting a local diner as a replacement, it was clear where I stood in Billy's priorities. Oh, uh, since the kids will miss out on grandma's cooking tonight, make sure to cook them something they like. Thanks. He added. Oh, hold on. I tried to keep him on the line. My parents gave us gifts for our 10th anniversary. They even said they wanted to hear about our dinner. Uh, gifts? Your parents always send stuff I don't like. Just toss anything that's not cash. Billy suggesting to throw away heartfelt gifts from our loved ones, I tried one last plea. Are you sure about that? You might regret it. Billy sounded puzzled but didn't change his mind. Oh, regret? Nah, just keep the cash. Oh, our food's here. Don't call again. Bye. I sighed as I hung up, noticing our kids looking worried. Who's up for helping me make dinner? Their enthusiastic hands shot up, lifting my spirits. After dinner, I sorted the gifts as Billy had instructed. Cash aside, everything else was to be discarded. Keep the cash and get rid of the rest. I felt ashamed and sorry for the people who had given us those gifts. How had I put up with such a man for 10 years? By the time I put the kids to bed, Billy was home. Don't you think it's a bit much to prioritize your mom even on our 10th anniversary? I was the one who suggested the dinner, and you knew how much I was looking forward to it. You could have dined with your mom any other day. Yeah, yeah, don't be so dramatic. I told you I would take you to the family diner. I'll even pay half for my allowance. That's not the point. You dismissed everyone's gifts for our anniversary. Enough already. I have work tomorrow. Can we just go to bed? Billy didn't want to discuss it further. After a quick shower, he went straight to sleep. The next morning, I thought I would give it one last shot. Uh, about the anniversary gifts? Billy, with a clearly annoyed expression, ignored what I was saying and left the living room. Without a word, he seemed to have gone to work. Still upset from the day before, I decided that I had done enough and given him plenty of chances after seeing his attitude. After sending the kids off to school, I received an urgent call from Billy within just three hours. I answered, thinking he called sooner than expected and Billy started speaking in a panicked tone. Hey, who did you get that gift you mentioned yesterday from? Um, like I said, from my parents, we also got some from friends, your boss Cyrus, and uh, even the president. What? You, you never mentioned? I did. I told you it was a gift from my parents. Parents? My father has been friends with Billy's boss and the president for years and our family have always been close. The two of them, who have treated me like family since I was little, had come over the previous evening to give us their gifts. The watch the president chose is so fancy even I know about it and the wine Cyrus brought looks delicious, but it doesn't matter now, right? You said to throw away anything that wasn't cash, 
So I did. What have you done? Do you even realize what you have done? Billy was furious, but I wondered on what grounds he was complaining. I tried to confirm with you if it was really okay and I tried to talk to you when you came home and again in the morning. You ignored me, Billy. Don't shift the blame, it's your fault for not listening. I hung up on him. Billy kept calling back, but I ignored all his calls. I might seem childish, but I couldn't contain my anger anymore. When Billy came home, I could hear his heavy footsteps from the entrance as he stormed into the living room. Enough is enough. Give me the gifts now. I told him I had thrown them in the morning thrash and they had already been collected. Billy, angrier than I had ever seen him, shoved me and stomped on the floor. Unbelievable! Can't you tell right from wrong? You knew it was our anniversary dinner, yet you went to a restaurant with your mother? And then telling me to throw away the gifts without even looking at them? I question your sanity. I confronted the yelling Billy. Throughout our heated argument, Billy kept insisting that I was the one in the wrong. You threw them away, so you apologize to them. I've already told everyone at work, so there's nothing we can do now. My anger exploded at Billy's selfish reasoning. Oh, really? Then I would like to apologize directly. Can you ask them to come here? What? What are you? Billy was visibly shaken by the words not meant for him, especially when he saw the door to the adjacent room open. He grunted in surprise as he faced his boss and the president, who had emerged from the other room. The two of them, having heard Billy's side of the story, found my actions quite out of character and had called to hear my side as well. I decided to tell them everything, including the fact that I had called your office while waiting for Billy to come home. After hearing my explanation, they felt bad that their gifts had caused a misunderstanding between us. They asked to hear our story again, so I invited them over. However, seeing how agitated Billy was when he got home, I asked him to wait in the next room to let him calm down. Billy, consumed by anger, didn't seem to notice their presence. Oh, um, Mr. President, I I'm sorry. Finally, realizing the situation, Billy turned pale, bowed deeply, and apologized to the two of them. He must have realized that he couldn't deny the story I had just shared, especially after trying to pin the blame on me. His previous anger was gone, replaced by deep remorse as he trembled. Lift your head. The president's voice was surprisingly gentle. Hope flickered in Billy's pale eyes. This is a domestic issue, unrelated to work. I won't reprimand you as the president. Yes, added his boss. It won't affect your job performance, but remember, we have been friends with Christina for a long time. We would prefer to keep our distance from you personally from now on. Billy, who had often boasted about his close relationship with them outside of work, looked devastated. How could you? And you, say something. Aren't you embarrassed to involve others in our marital spat? This isn't just a marital spat. You mishandle the gifts we received and as a result you lost their trust. And honestly, I don't need a husband who prioritizes his mother over his wife and family and even tries to blame his mistakes on me. I'm filing for a divorce. I declared confidently and left the house. Glad that I had sent the kids to my parents' house earlier. Rumors spread at Billy's workplace about our divorce and his changed relationship with his superiors. His colleagues, whom he had once looked down upon, now mocked him for not being able to even chat with his bosses without a wife by his side. After the divorce, he saw our kids once a month while paying child support. But he kept complaining about the money and tried to guilt trip the kids into living with him again. As they approached their teens, they started to resist seeing him. Now, respecting the kids' wishes, we have temporarily stopped their visits. When dad cared more about grandma than us, I realized we don't need to live with him. My daughter once told Billy. I still laugh thinking about his reaction. After declaring the divorce, I returned the gifts which I had secretly kept to the president and Cyrus, apologizing for the trouble. They accepted them and Cyrus even jokingly gifted me my favorite wine as a divorce gift. 
I believe our relationship with them, including my parents, will continue. Later, after the divorce was finalized, I was invited to a home party at the president's house with my kids. There, I was offered a job at a company run by the president's brother. Ignoring all of Billy's annoying attempts at reconciliation, I now work in a supportive environment and the three of us live happily. Ugh, it's such a hassle to be called in like this. I had to be hospitalized for an injury and needed a guarantor signature, so I asked my eldest son's wife, Olivia, to help. But Olivia just keeps complaining. To begin with, she looks down on me because she knows I live on a $700 monthly pension. The wedding gift was just a cheap one, barely a thousand dollars. It's unbelievable. Every time we meet, she has something to complain about, and it's getting on my nerves. I manage just fine on $700 a month, so why does she feel the need to belittle me like this? Isn't the thought that counts for a wedding gift? Being judged solely on the amount of money is just... I tried to avoid Olivia as much as possible because talking to her just put me in a bad mood. Then one day... Olivia told me she wanted to cut family ties. I'd really rather not have to take care of you in your old age, just because you're my husband's mother. She probably thinks I'll be in a bind if she cuts me off. Olivia grinned triumphantly. Would that actually be a bad thing? Huh? Ignoring Olivia's confusion, I decided to sever the family ties. A few months later, Olivia found out something shocking and came storming into my house. I am Marie, 68 years old. I live alone in Boston. My husband passed away two years ago due to a worsening chronic illness. Now my younger son and his wife live nearby and look out for me. My eldest son, John, works for a global company and is too busy to come home often. However, he always sends me flowers and gifts for my birthday and Mother's Day. The same kind-hearted John announced at 38 that he'd finally found someone he wanted to marry. We decided to have a family meeting at home and John brought Olivia. She was incredibly cheerful and the meeting ended on a positive note, leading to a smooth engagement. The wedding was scheduled for six months later to accommodate John's busy schedule, but I took the wedding gift to John's house as soon as they registered their marriage. Mother-in-law, thank you for coming today. Oh, don't mention it. I'm just here to give the wedding gift. Oh, I'm so excited. I give Olivia the dishware I bought as a wedding gift, beaming with joy. I wanted to give something tangible, rather than just financial support. I figured they'd already have furniture, so after some thought, I settled on dishware. But the moment Olivia sees the wedding gift, she freezes. Wait, this is the wedding gift? Yes, it's a set of matching teacups. I thought they were cute. Is something wrong? I start to worry that maybe it's not to her taste. However, the response I get is completely unexpected. You're giving me this cheap stuff as a wedding gift? Um, cheap? Are you kidding me? A wedding gift should be around $10,000, right? I thought you were rich because you lived in a nice house. Was I wrong? Oh, Olivia. I'm taken aback by this sudden change in Olivia. Her gestures, her tone, everything is different. There's no trace of the polite and cheerful Olivia I met at the family meeting. How are you making a living right now, mother-in-law? I'm on a pension. How much is the pension? Seven hundred dollars. Ugh, you really are broke. What a scam. Living in such a nice house and still being broke is just the worst. Olivia crosses her legs and sighs. Living on $700 a month? That's so pathetic. Ugh. How are you even surviving? Olivia's mocking tone irks me. 
I managed just fine on $700, thank you. Well, that's great. Just don't come asking me for help when you're broke. Turns out, Olivia is the kind of person who changes her attitude based on income and assets. Feeling demeaned and upset, I decided to head home right away. For about a month since then, I've thought several times about telling John about Olivia's true character. But our schedules never aligned, and I haven't been able to share it with him. I've spent the days feeling quite uneasy. Standing in a traffic light, lost in thought, I'm suddenly hit by a speeding bicycle and fractured my arm. It wasn't a severe injury, but surgery and hospitalization were necessary. I was told I needed a co-signer for the hospital admission, and they asked me to contact a family member. As soon as I texted my sons, I received a call from John. Mom, are you okay? How's the injury? I'm fine for now. I've taken some painkillers. About the co-signer for the hospital, it's going to be tough for my brothers and me. We're sending Olivia instead. Olivia? Yeah, it's a weekday, and by the time we get off work, visiting hours would be over. Olivia doesn't work, so she can go. I see. To be honest, I really didn't want to see Olivia. But I couldn't afford to be picky. My middle son Michael and his wife Sophia are both teachers. They're busy not only working late, but also raising two kids. Even John sometimes gets home past 10 p.m. He's that swamped. I really couldn't impose on them. So I asked John, and we decided to have Olivia come. When Olivia arrived at the hospital, it was pretty clear she wasn't thrilled to be there. Being called out like this is just the worst. I'm sorry. Everyone else is working, you know. Just because I'm a homemaker doesn't mean I have free time, you know. I was prepared for some complaints, but her blatant attitude started to get under my skin. By the way, you can pay the hospital fees, right? Of course, I'll cover it myself. No need to worry. Fine. But don't pathetically ask for loans, saying you're broke. From now on, the money John makes isn't just his, you know. She signs the papers with a smug smile and hands them to me. To begin with, I didn't want to deal with this hassle. I regret causing you trouble. I'll try to ask someone else in the future. You better. The thought of more caregiving or hospital stays is depressing. I really don't want the hassle of looking after you in your old age. <laughs> Her rude behavior made me want to limit my interactions with Olivia as much as possible and couldn't wait for her to leave. Why did I have to put up with such harsh words when I didn't even want to be hospitalized? It was hard to accept. Don't worry. Michael and Sophia are around, and I'll make preparations so I don't inconvenience anyone. I tried to act as normal as possible. I didn't want to stir the pot, especially in front of the nurses and other patients. Then go ahead and do as you please. Don't come crying to me when no one helps and you regret it later. I'll make sure it doesn't come to that. Good, because even if you play the I'm the eldest son's daughter-in-law card later, it won't help. So why don't you sever family ties right now? She probably thought that saying sever family ties would make me uncomfortable. But honestly, I wouldn't be bothered if I cut ties with Olivia. Worst comes to worst, I'll manage my later years even without my children's support. I'm okay with it, but what about you? Huh? Of course it's fine. Despite being taken aback by my unexpected response, Olivia nodded. She probably thinks I'll be in trouble without my kids' support because I'm poor and live alone. All right, let's sever family ties then. I won't contact you anymore and I'll delete your number. Do whatever you want. You're such an annoying old hag. Olivia, irritated by my laid-back attitude, stomped out with exaggerated, heavy footsteps. I had planned to help with the wedding expenses, but after seeing Olivia's attitude, I decided against it. 
There's no way I'm giving money to someone who talks about cutting off family ties. I swore to myself that I'd never rely on Olivia. Then I had my surgery and was discharged from the hospital a few weeks later. I continued with my rehab and carried on with my life. Even while hospitalized, I remembered how Olivia severed our family ties. I was determined never to depend on my children. So, I didn't ask for help after I got out of the hospital. But, on the day of my discharge, my second son and his wife came to help without a word. And it didn't stop there. They frequently assisted with groceries and other errands. Sophia, you're busy with work. You don't have to go out of your way. Isn't it inconvenient with just one arm? Don't hesitate to ask for help. I'm doing it because I want to. Sophia's kindness touched my heart. I found myself getting angry when comparing Sophia to Olivia. I haven't had any contact with Olivia since. I even thought about canceling my plans to attend her wedding and reach out to my son. I doubt we'll have any further involvement in each other's lives. Two weeks after my discharge, I noticed something strange while being taken shopping. Sophia, do you hear that odd noise coming from the car? Yes, actually, the side mirror broke, and it's been making this weird sound. The car's a bit old, so it looks like I'll have to replace it. I'm really not sure what to do. That's tough. But you do need a car, right? You drive to work, don't you? Yes, but even a compact car is a considerable expense. Seeing Sophia struggle with, with this decision, I made a suggestion. Then let me buy it for you. What? I can't accept something that expensive? It's okay. You've been helping me out. By driving me around, consider it a thank you. But still, if you feel bad about it, how about you continue to take me shopping until my arm heals? Thinking it might be too much to ask, I was delighted when Sophia greeted the idea with a warm smile. Of course, let's keep going shopping together, even after your injury heals. Hearing her say that, a smile broke across my own face. So I ended up buying a new car for Sophia. Life settled into a peaceful rhythm, almost making me forget about the whole Olivia ordeal, especially with my younger son's family visiting and checking on me regularly. Several weeks later, my injury had improved significantly, to the point where I could carry light items again. That day, I didn't have any rehab appointments, so I was lounging at home watching TV, when the doorbell suddenly rang. Checking the monitor, I saw Olivia standing there. What could she possibly want after declaring our family ties severed? Suspicious? I opened the door, and the moment she saw my face, she started shouting. What's the meaning of this? What's gotten into you? I can't think of anything I've done to deserve this anger. I saw Sophia, your son's wife, driving a brand new car the other day. And what's your point? Don't play dumb. That nice car is worth over $10,000. There's no way she could afford that on a teacher's salary with kids. When I asked her how she got the car... She said mother-in-law bought it for her. Well, yes. She mentioned her car was breaking down and needed replacing, so I gifted it to her. I don't see what's wrong with giving a car to my son's wife. You never give me anything, yet you spoil, Sophia. You're truly a terrible person for showing such favoritism. If you can easily gift a car, why not contribute more to our wedding? Well, Sophia helps out with errands and chores around the house. You're the one who cut off ties, so why would I give you anything? You wanted to sever the relationship, didn't you, Olivia? Uh, well, yes, but still. How can you afford a new car worth over $10,000? You're not that rich, are you? Who said I was poor? I inherited real estate from my husband, you know. Real estate? Olivia looked shocked. My husband was a salaried employee but he had a decent income and had invested in real estate. He owned an apartment complex which I inherited after he passed away. 
I've been saving the rent money little by little each month. I get by just fine on my pension, but I like to travel every year, so I've been saving up. I'm not hurting for money, and if worse comes to worse, selling the property could net me several hundred thousand dollars. Several hundred thousand dollars? If you have that much money, you should have said something. Why should I? You're the one who misunderstood. I never said I was struggling financially or that I needed to borrow money. Stop lying. This is infuriating. <sighs> I sighed at Olivia's childish tantrum. Why would I go out of my way to brag about my assets? That would be embarrassing. She's glaring at me, clearly not convinced. I wasn't deceiving you. Originally, I had thought about contributing money for the wedding. But then you said you wanted to cut ties with the family, so I changed my mind. Why? It's your son's wedding. Aren't you happy for him? I was happy for John's wedding, but I didn't want to give any money to you, Olivia. Why would you say that? If you have the money, then what's the problem in sharing some? Everyone's being so stingy, it's making me mad. Olivia started stomping her feet on the ground. Is a 30-year-old woman not embarrassed to act this way just because things aren't going her way? Why do you want so much money in the first place? What? Isn't it obvious? I want to have fun. And there are a lot of things I want to buy. John only gives me $2,000 a month, saying that's enough. $2,000 isn't enough for you? Of course not. Even a decent bag costs at least $5,000. I shook my head at Olivia's reckless spending. I truly wondered how John could have fallen for such a woman. Olivia's anger showed no sign of warning, and her complaints about John were endless. I even married John, thinking he had money. If I'd known he was this stingy, I would have never married him. Is John really that stingy? Absolutely he is. He only gives me an extra $500 on top of rent and living expenses. Even the gifts are capped at around $2,000. It's unbelievable. If he's making over a million a year, he should be giving me more. I thought once we were married, I could spend money however I wanted. So, you married him for his money? Well, duh. Why else would I willingly marry a guy pushing 40? It has to be for the money. At that moment, my anger boiled over. There's no way I could forgive someone for belittling my precious son like this. Just as I was about to yell at Olivia, John approached from behind her. Let's get a divorce then. What? J John, what are you doing here? I heard from Mom that she still won't attend our wedding because she wants to cut ties with you. So I came here to get the full story. Overheard you two arguing and decided to stick around. You had quite a lot to say, didn't you? Um, this isn't what it looks like. I mean... Olivia looked panicked, breaking into a cold sweat. I had no idea John was even here. Ignoring the flustered Olivia, I continued to speak. So you came all this way. How long have you been listening? From the part where you were talking about how you could afford to buy a car despite being poor. So you've heard most of the conversation. I've been labeled as poor, and someone who she won't take care of. In my old age. That's why she wants to cut ties. No further explanation was given for not attending the wedding. John nodded, his expression stern. I don't need any more explanations. I understand Olivia well enough now. No, you've got it all wrong. This is a misunderstanding. It's not a misunderstanding. I heard you clearly say, you're in it for the money. I can't be with someone like that. Let's get a divorce. Wait a minute, now of all times? I quit my job because we got married. Olivia desperately grabs onto John's arm, shaking it. But John shakes off her grip, shooting her a cold look. That's not my problem. I hope you find a new job soon. Don't be so heartless. I can't live without you. I have no place to go and no savings. Why don't you sell your clothes and bags for cash? That should get you through a few days. 
although I don't know who would rent an apartment to someone without a job. Stop it. Don't say that. I even bragged about marrying you to my friends. How can I tell them there's no marriage now? It's too embarrassing, please. That's all on you. Maybe you'll be the talk of the town for all the wrong reasons. Olivia had never seen John so angry before. A man usually known for his calm demeanor. Her face turns pale as she begins to apologize profusely. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I won't talk like that again. I don't even need the money. Just don't divorce me. No matter how much she apologized, John's expression remained stern. I can't even stand to look at you anymore. Leave right now. No, please reconsider. Come on, please. Just so you know, it's not only about the money. How could you tell someone's parents that you want to cut ties because you don't want to care for them? If I'd known you were such a cold person, I never would have married you in the first place. At the sound of John's raised voice, Olivia starts to cry. Don't ever show your face in front of me again. No! <laughs> Olivia starts crying, her face covered by her hands. But no one is there to console her. I felt a bit relieved that John understood her true nature. And I felt relieved that I no longer had to be deceived by such a nasty woman. John, realizing why I declined to attend the wedding, apologized and left. Realizing she's hit a dead end, Olivia gave me a piercing glare and walked away, clearly disappointed. Afterwards, I heard that John and Olivia got divorced, and she moved into an old apartment. Before their marriage, she apparently worked as a receptionist at a shopping mall but was on the verge of getting fired due to her poor work attitude. It seems like she wanted to marry someone wealthy so she could quit her job quickly. Unable to find another job due to her lack of qualifications and skills, Olivia apparently started working nights. Olivia, now over 30, apparently isn't making as much money as she'd hoped. And I hear she's living a pretty frugal life while complaining all the way. On the other hand, it looks like John has found a new love interest. I was worried about how quickly he'd move on, but after meeting her, I found she's a genuinely calm and sincere person. She herself had been married, cheated on, and then divorced. That common history of divorce brought them together. It's funny how divorce can lead to new beginnings, but I feel more at ease with her. We work together and know each other's character well. John said this with a smile. I consider myself most fortunate to have married and met my children. So I hope John can find a loving family through marriage as well. But marriage isn't the only path to happiness. Some people are choosing not to marry these days, and there's no need to rush into it. If you meet someone wonderful and feel like you want to marry, then go for it. I hope John finds his way to a happy life from here on out. Why are you acting so high and mighty over a mere $300? We don't need your chum change. <laughs> <laughs> Laughing, my son and daughter-in-law looked down on me, hurling hurtful words. I've supported them for 10 years, knowing they were struggling. Seeing the two of them never settling into steady jobs, I always held back my complaints, wondering how I could help. And this is the thanks I get? Why did I ever think of helping them? I believe that one day, they'd appreciate my efforts and change their attitudes. But that day never came. Isn't that answer enough? They've taken 10 years of my time and drained my hard-earned savings. Yet, they scoff at my assistance, saying it's not enough, and just pay or change. I've given everything for my son and his wife without saying a word for 10 years. But that ends today. My name is Susanna, a woman in her 50s. My husband passed away, and now I live alone. We have one son, David. He moved out after college, married a woman, and started his family. 
Their home is close to mine, but truth be told, we don't get along. Son and daughter-in-law was what you would call a reason. David married Anissa, a co-worker from his first job after college. Anissa left the job when they got married. But less than a year later, David quit his job. Apparently, he got into trouble with his boss. David thought he could quickly find another job. But things didn't go as planned. He struggled to find a suitable position and eventually gave up on working altogether. Anissa showed no signs of wanting to work either, and they quickly fell into financial hardships. To help, I started giving them $300 a month. They were grateful at first, and I hoped they'd eventually stand on their own. But 10 years later, my monthly support seemed like a given to them, not a gift. One month, when I was busy with family events and couldn't meet them for the uh, usual handoff, they came knocking late at night. Mom, you have to give us our money. Are you forgetting things in your old age? Every time David teased me, my exhaustion from consecutive days would overwhelm me. I give you the allowance another time. Can you please leave for today? But Anissa, with her face burning with anger, shouted, This happens every month. Just because you're my mom-in-law doesn't mean you can treat me this way and grab me by the collar. Suddenly, wide awake from the shock, I handed over the already prepared $300 to my son and daughter-in-law that day. You should have given it to us straightforwardly from the beginning. I don't want to raise my hand against my mom-in-law, she said. That's right, David chimed in. Please listen to what we have to say. If mom gets dementia in the future, we're the ones who will be taking care of her. Wouldn't it be smart to be in our good graces now? Their audacity infuriated me. But if I retaliated and displayed a domineering attitude now, I might endure their pride. I didn't want them ending up like David when he had left his job, possibly never regaining their footing in life. With that thought in mind, I swallowed my frustration smiled and simply said i'm sorry accepting their words i retrospect i think i had a wrong approach from that time onward however my overwhelming desire for them to somehow get their act together prevented me from seeing things clearly but that wasn't the only unpleasant memory with them one day at work i got a call from a neighbor who has always been kind to us Susanna, can I talk to you for a moment? It's about your son and daughter-in-law. Oh my, I'm so sorry. I'll be right over. Apparently, when the neighbor returned from shopping, there were signs of a break-in. And after checking the security camera footage, the culprits turned out to be my son and daughter-in-law. Though the room was a mess, fortunately nothing was stolen. The neighbor, knowing our situation, chose to contact me first instead of the authorities. I left work early, got in touch with David and Anissa, and the three of us went to apologize. I am deeply sorry, I kept repeating, while David and Anissa showed no signs of remorse. Although our neighbor was visibly upset, after agreeing to cover the cause of the broken window, the matter was settled. But on our way home, David and Anissa made a shocking statement. Why are you old folks so narrow-minded? We just wanted to borrow a few things. David scoffed. I let out an incredulous, What? But without even glancing at me, Anissa added. Exactly. What did we even do? We might have broken a window and ransacked the place, but we didn't steal anything. Isn't she overreacting? To which David nodded. Exactly. I couldn't fathom their justification and stayed silent the entire time. I regretted not standing up to them and expressing how I felt. Could say it was my weakness that I couldn't do that. The episodes of David and Anissa's unchecked behavior continued to stand out. Thankfully, apart from the incident with the neighbor, they didn't trouble anyone else. I continued giving them their allowance. And whenever they pleaded for something, 
If it was within my budget, I'd buy it for them. David wanted toys and gadgets to fit in with his friends. Anissa craved branded items so she wouldn't feel inferior to others. Their demands escalated over time, and they began to rely on me for just about everything. It wasn't just about money anymore. On my days off, they'd call me over to do their household chores, working me tirelessly. We all need money to survive. They had neither the means nor the will to earn their own, so I had no choice but to support them. No matter how exhausted I was, I worked hard. Even when I was drained from work, I managed to do the household chores they asked of me. As a result, my health deteriorated. Dark circles formed under my eyes, my skin broke out, and I constantly felt dizzy. Seeing me like this, my son and daughter-in-law joke, You look like a monster. Anissa pointed at me and said, You give it up on being a woman. I was too drained to even respond to their cruel words. I knew I was reaching my limit. But I believed that if I didn't keep going, both they and I would be ruined. So I pushed through, doing my best to keep moving forward. Deep down, I wished I could lean on someone else, admit I didn't want to push myself anymore. Then one day, while doing chores at their house, a minor incident led to a big argument. I was worn out and had no patience left, so every little thing they did irritated me. Anissa snapped. All this fuss over just $300? David, taking her cue, said, I don't need such chump change. <laughs> and handed back the $300 I had just given him. If you want to give us money, bring a better amount. <laughs> they laughed, looking down on me. That was the last straw for me. I get it. I'll stop then. Without thinking about the future or their well-being, the words just spilled out. They tilted their heads in confusion. But when I started packing to leave, they burst into laughter. Mom, stop joking. <laughs> without us, you'd be all alone. You wouldn't survive without your precious son and daughter-in-law. <laughs> mom in law when did you become such a joker? <laughs> that joke wasn't funny. You had me worried for a second. <laughs> Thinking I wasn't serious about stopping the financial support, they continued to mock me. Go ahead and try. <laughs> but if you do, we'll cut ties with you. <laughs> Let's see if you have the guts to live all alone. <laughs> Come on. Our spineless mom-in-law can't do that, right? <laughs> you want to take back what you said in no time. <laughs> Seeing their cruel behavior, I finally woke up. Why was I sending them money, buying them things and doing their chores? What was in it for me? I was just being taken advantage of. They treated me like a housemaid. And even at my breaking point, they acted this way. They might be my family by law, but I couldn't recognize them as such with their behavior. Sorry, but I'm serious. Don't regret your words later. Even after I said that, they just laughed, thinking it was a joke. Go ahead and try. <laughs> But you'll regret it. I can already see it. <laughs> David's words ignited a fire within me. I was determined to make them pay. I would make them realize how valuable I was to them and how wrong they were to treat me so poorly. As I packed my things to leave, all I could think was how I'd make them suffer. First, I cut off all the financial support I had been providing to my son and daughter-in-law. No more money, no more financial aid, and no more household help. For someone who had lived for their sake, this act of not considering them at all was a first for me. I could finally rest without thinking about them. I could spend my money on myself and only do household chores to my satisfaction. I realized 
how liberating it was to live this way. They said I'd never be able to cut ties and live alone. But this life, free from others' control, was exactly what I had been longing for the past decade. I decided to take another step to corner them. The apartment they were living in was actually rented in my name after they lost their previous home due to financial troubles. Of course, I was the one paying the rent. If I was cutting off all support, it made no sense to continue paying the rent. So I contacted the apartment manager and decided to terminate the lease. The manager, aware of our situation, was understanding and agreed. In a month, they'd have to leave the apartment or the police would be notified. That night, I messaged them. If you don't leave the apartment within a month, it'll become a police matter. They read the message immediately and within minutes, my phone rang. Mom, what's going on? Where are we supposed to live? David yelled. I could hear Anissa panicking in the background. Did you forget I was the one paying the rent for that apartment? I told you, I'm cutting off all support. So, it's only natural I end up the lease too, right? We never agreed to that. We thought you were just stopping the monthly allowance, not everything else. David's entitled response made me chuckle. After all the hurtful things they said, they still expected me to support them in other ways. Their audacity was dizzying. I had given them everything. My money, my time, all for their sake. All because I wanted them to have a self-sufficient life. But it was a mistake. The more I indulged them, the more they took advantage. In that case, I should have made my stance clear and made them listen to me from the start. I was the one who sent them money, provided financial support, and did their chores. No matter how you look at it, I held a higher ground compared to my son and daughter-in-law. They should have shown respect and gratitude, yet they treated me like a mere housemaid, a tool, an ATM, and even had the audacity to mock me when I was at my lowest. Why did I try so hard for them? Even when they were unreasonable, I endured without speaking up. All they did was take advantage of my kindness. It took me reaching my breaking point to realize how selfish and ungrateful they were and that they never truly saw me as a family. They may have seen me as useful, but never as a family member. Why didn't I see it sooner? Why did I keep doing my best until I felt like I had reached my limit? Why did I keep giving and believing? My past actions now seem so pitiful. I believe they've someday become independent, but it was all for nothing. Regretting the past, my anger towards them surged. I needed to confront them, make them admit their wrongs, and apologize. Unless he admits his past sins and apologizes, he will not be satisfied. Feeling this way, I spoke up again. You thought I'd stop the allowance but continue other support? How naive can you be? David tried to interject. But... I cut him off. No buts. Do you realize how much you've relied on me? You should be grateful. Instead, you've taken advantage of me. Why would I want to keep supporting you? Listen, your lives have always depended on me. If you upset me even once and I felt like not helping you, that would have been the end for you. It's a good thing I was so naive. I keep hoping you'd someday stand on your own, that you wouldn't always need my help. I was such a kind-hearted mom. Yeah, mom is kind. You don't really want to abandon us, right? You said things in the heat of the moment and now you can take them back. We forgive you, mom. Let's try to be a family again, okay? Don't be ridiculous. I've opened my eyes. No matter how hard I tried to support you, you never wanted to be independent. You just wanted to live comfortably on my dime, right? David, sounding panic, replied. That's not true. We did want to be independent, but it's hard. Neither of us feels motivated to find a job. We did our best, but it wasn't enough. I almost laughed at his words. Did your best? 
I've watched you two for years. You never tried to find jobs or live frugally. You just enjoyed carefree life on my dime. Listen, mom, we're truly grateful for everything you've done. We know we owe our lives to you. We need you. Let's start over. What? Why would I need you? One's an unemployed man who's been jobless for a decade, and the other's fake housewife who only thinks of herself. Why would I want you in my life? Do you know how much I've sacrificed for you? I've worked every day to provide for you, even doing chores on my days off. I'm not foolish enough to want that life anymore. Don't say that, Mom. We need you. Without someone like you to support us, we... No matter how much I tell him, David doesn't listen to my opinion and tries to push his own opinion. Before I could reply, I heard, Let me talk. And Anisa took the phone. Mom-in-law, I'm fed up with David's selfishness too. Men should work and support their families, but he just plays around. I regret marrying him every day. I'm a victim just like you. Please help me. Anisa was trying to save herself at David's expense. When I was stunned by his attitude, Anisa continued speaking. She continued, I'll do anything. Be your housemaid, whatever you want, please don't abandon me. After those words, I could hear son and daughter-in-law arguing again over the phone, fighting over who gets to speak. Suddenly, due to the loudness, or maybe they bumped into something, the call got disconnected. Days went by without another call from my son and daughter-in-law. It seemed their relationship deteriorated significantly after that incident, leading them to decide on a divorce and go their separate ways. They blame each other, even demanding alimony, causing a lot of disputes before the divorce was finalized. After the divorce, both tried to reach out to me. However, by that time, I had already blocked their numbers, so I never heard their side of the story. David started working part-time at a factory, day and night, managing to make ends meet. On the other hand, Anisa, in tears, fled back to her former in-law's house when she confessed everything to her former step-parents they were furious. She was brought by her former step-parents to apologize, but she cried throughout, making it hard to understand her. Since then, I'd been living for myself. For 10 years, I was bound by the presence of son and daughter-in-law, never truly cherishing my own time. Living a life centered on myself felt incredibly refreshing and irresistibly appealing. Losing son and daughter-in-law left me all alone in the world, but I came to see that as a blessing. I don't know what the future holds. There might come a time when I can't live just for myself anymore. But for now, I've decided to live solely for my own sake. Get out if all you're going to do is sleep. You're in the way. Such a useless wife. The one spewing the hurtful words, sadly, was my husband's mother. My mother-in-law. Ever since I was diagnosed with cancer, I've been so tired, and often found myself resting. My unhinged mother-in-law seemed to think I was just being lazy. It would constantly berate me. I can't stand her. Just when I felt I couldn't take it anymore, my husband, who was supposed to be on a business trip abroad, walked in with someone. My name is Sophia, a 32-year-old housewife. I've been married to Jackson, whom I met at a different department in the same company, for six years. We have a five-year-old daughter named Emma. After giving birth to Emma, I switched to a part-time job in the mornings and always picked her up from kindergarten myself. We'd have dinner together and occasionally go out for fun. I thought our simple, happy life would last forever. But about a year ago, our life took a turn. I found out I was pregnant with our second child, but I felt something off in my breast. After getting it checked, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Worse, it was in an advanced stage known as locally advanced breast cancer. I had lost my mother to the same type of cancer, so I always made sure to get annual checkups. But that year, 
with work and childcare, I got busy and delayed my hospital visit. Had I gone earlier, maybe the outcome would have been different. I was told that the cancer cells had probably broken through the skin at an early stage. The doctor declared it was stage four cancer. I was trembling with fear at the doctor's announcement, unable to stop my tears. I didn't want to believe this was happening. I was faced with the choice of prioritizing treatment or going through with the pregnancy. I'll discuss it with my husband tonight. On the bus ride home, I tried hard to hold back my tears. After putting Emma to bed, Jackson and I talked. I had informed him a bit via WhatsApp, but saying it out loud made it all too real, and we both broke down. I expressed my desire to have the baby, but Jackson said, This time, let's prioritize your health. I can't bear the thought of losing you. I appreciated Jackson's sentiments, but I couldn't decide right away. However, before I could make a choice, I miscarried. I cried my heart out that day, apologizing to the unborn child. Further tests indicated that I might not be able to conceive again. While my dad and father-in-law were supportive and comforting, my mother-in-law said, Can't even produce an heir. Truly useless. When we were alone. I was determined to beat cancer and live a happy life with Jackson and Emma. I started with chemotherapy, aiming to shrink the tumor to a size where it could be entirely removed. To focus on my treatment, I had to quit my job. Being hospitalized for chemotherapy was tough, especially on Emma, who was only four at the time. No, mom, don't go. Saying goodbye in front of the hospital, I tried to comfort my crying daughter, but it broke my heart. I felt so guilty making young Emma feel this way. Until Jackson got home, Emma would be taken care of by my mother-in-law after kindergarten, which I really disliked. Because once, after being scolded by my mother-in-law, Emma cried even harder. Emma, don't be selfish. It's okay if mommy doesn't get better, right? She might be right in what she's saying, but I thought there's no need to speak that way to a four-year-old. I've always had a hard time with my mother-in-law, even disliking her since the beginning of our marriage. She's incredibly harsh, speaks aggressively, and doesn't hesitate to say hurtful things. During family meetings, she would critically assess everyone, asking about my education and family background. When she found out my mother battled breast cancer, she said, Doesn't that mean Sophia has a high chance of inheriting it? Maybe you shouldn't get married. In the end, she was scolded by Jackson and my father-in-law and kept quiet. But when they weren't around, she never missed a chance to make snide remarks. I always wanted Jackson to marry Olivia. Olivia is a childhood friend of Jackson's and a violinist. A graduate from prestigious music school and apparently a favorite of my mother-in-law. She's currently studying abroad, so I've never met her. Jackson assured me she's just an old friend, but my mother-in-law would always bring up Olivia's name and compare me to her. My mother-in-law has always been controlling, especially with Jackson, her son. But with me hospitalized, Jackson couldn't manage everything alone, so we had to rely on mother-in-law. Their house is about a 30-minute drive from ours. My father-in-law holds a significant position in a big company, so they're quite wealthy. Mother-in-law is a housewife spending her days attending various hobby classes and hosting tea parties with friends. I secretly wondered how someone with such a sharp personality could have friends, but in our current situation, we had no choice but to rely on her. Thank you, mother-in-law, for taking care of Emma, I said. Oh, don't be so formal. We're family, though I might have to skip some of my classes. Oh, don't worry about it. I wanted to retort to her daily dose of sarcasm, but held back, forcing a smile. Even though I disliked my mother-in-law, she was the only option we had. She might be harsh, but she did care for Emma, her granddaughter, when she wasn't scolding her. Then, my chemotherapy began. I received encouraging messages from my dad, father-in-law, Jackson, and Emma, which gave me the strength to persevere. Of course, there were no messages from mother-in-law. Locally advanced breast cancer is quite challenging. 
Apart from the pain, the tumor protruding from the skin was hot, emitted a foul odor, and dampened my clothes. Being summer, the smell seemed even more potent. I felt terrible thinking I was causing discomfort to my family, medical staff, and others around me. During my hospital stay, I looked forward to messages and video calls from Jackson and Emma. Mom, hang in there with the treatment. Emma's being a good girl. Her sweet voice over the video gave me the strength to endure the painful chemotherapy sessions. Despite the severe nausea and difficulty eating, the treatment finally ended, and the shrunken tumor could be surgically removed. By the end of the summer, I was set to be discharged. The doctor advised, You'll be under observation from now on. Please come for regular checkups. If any cancer cells remain, we'll collaborate with plastic surgery department for grafting during removal, followed by radiation therapy. I was told it would be challenging to achieve a complete cure, but I was just happy to be going home. Jackson and Emma came to pick me up from the hospital. Seeing Emma after so long, she ran and hugged me and I hugged her back tightly. Thank you, Jackson. I'm sorry for leaving Emma with you for so long. I've lost weight, haven't I? Look at my hair, I said, trying to make light of the situation by touching the sparse hair left on my head. Jackson, with tears in his eyes, hugged me and said, You've been through a lot. A few days later, we went to my in-law's house for post-discharge celebration. I deeply thanked my father-in-law and mother-in-law. Thank you both for everything. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. While father-in-law responded warmly, mother-in-law remained cold and distant. Let's eat. When I tried to help, she surprisingly said, You just got out of the hospital. Sit down and rest. Probably because Jackson and father-in-law were there. That night, we stayed over. Jackson had to rush to work, so after putting Emma to bed, I took my painkillers and another medicine to reduce the odor. After changing my bandages and taking a warm shower to ease the pain, I was about to put my used towel in the washing machine when mother-in-law burst in. What's this awful smell? Don't put your towel in our machine. It'll transfer the odor, she said, pinching her nose dramatically. She then stared at my chest and laughed. What's with that chest? It looks disgusting. I was taken aback. I seriously thought I was crazy. Ignoring her seemed the best option to avoid wasting energy. I never missed my monthly checkups, but my condition wasn't improving much. Jackson always took time off to accompany me diligently noting down the doctor's advice. I was filled with gratitude. Despite mother-in-law's comments, I decided to undergo surgery to remove the remaining cancer cells. It wasn't a cure, but it would improve my quality of life. Even if I don't like spending time in a room that smells bad, this time I didn't have to stay in the hospital for as long, so Jackson took some time off. After the surgery, the odor began to diminish gradually. On days when I felt strong enough, I enjoyed taking walks with Emma or baking together. Still, many days were filled with fatigue, making it hard to do household chores. Jackson, without any complaints, took the initiative in doing the housework. Even after a tiring day at work, he cared for Emma, and I couldn't thank him enough. I'm sorry, Jackson. I put so much on you. You have nothing to apologize for, Sophia. Just rest and get better soon. I've always cherished Jackson's kindness, even before we got married. My mom passed away from cancer shortly after our wedding. She was given only six months to live, but managed to stay with us longer. She was overjoyed about our marriage. Though she couldn't attend the wedding, she cried tears of joy seeing my bridal photos. I wish she could have met her granddaughter, Emma. I yearn for a long life with Jackson and Emma. I hope to hold Emma's children in my arms someday. All I could do was focus on my treatments. Then one day, an incident occurred. Jackson informed me he had to go on a week-long business trip. I'm really sorry. Can you stay at my parents' house for just a week? Jackson knew about the challenges of living with mother-in-law, but was unaware of the harsh words she often directed at me. The thought of spending a week with mother-in-law was daunting, especially with young Emma around but I reluctantly agreed to Jackson's proposal. Father-in-law was very welcoming in front of father-in-law. Mother-in-law wouldn't say, don't worry about a thing. Just ask if you need help. But I couldn't forget the hurtful words she'd said during my last visit. A few days after Jackson left for China, after dropping Emma off at kindergarten, I felt extremely lethargic. As I was about to rest, mother-in-law suddenly came in and demanded, 
clean the house, do the laundry, prepare dinner, and tidy up the garden. Where are you going, mother-in-law? Anywhere I want. Just make sure you work while you're alive. She left without waiting for a response. I was too weak to do any chores and decided to rest. Feeling helpless and tired, I lay down on the bed. I seemed to have a fever and I thought I had come to see my mother-in-law just for something like this, but I couldn't do anything. I felt feverish and texted Jackson about my condition. I must have fallen asleep because I was jolted awake by someone shaking me. How long will you sleep? Get up! I woke up to mother-in-law's loud voice and her glaring at me. If you're just going to sleep, leave. You're such a burden. Why haven't you done what I asked? Her shrill voice made my headache even worse. You've been discharged, so work. You neglect Emma and make Jackson do all the housework. I feel sorry for him. Mother-in-law continued to berate me. Even without being told, I feel more guilty than anyone about Jackson and Emma. But my body is just so weak. Even if they say I can be discharged, I can't just get up and move immediately. If I could, I wouldn't be here. You should have never married someone like him. Poor Emma, having you as a mom. The harsh words kept coming, and with my fever and fatigue, tears started to form. I'm sorry, please forgive me. I'll do my best with the treatment. All I could do was apologize. You're not recovering because you lack determination. You rushed into marriage because you wanted to show your mom a happy face, and now you have cancer. A wife who just lies around is nothing but a burden. You can't even have more kids. But don't worry, even without you, I'll make sure Jackson remarries and Emma gets a proper mom. What? What is she talking about? Olivia is back from abroad, so don't worry about Jackson and Emma. Just divorce him gracefully. Mother-in-law, Jackson has his own life. Don't think you can control everything just because he's your son. Shut up. You won't be around for long anyway. Just leave. How cruel. You really have a way with hurtful words. Just as I managed to retort, someone entered the living room. Grandma, I hate you. Why are you so mean to mom? Emma, tears streaming down her face, ran to me and hugged me. Huh? Emma? I thought she was at kindergarten. I checked the clock and it was already past 3 p.m. Then, Jackson, who was supposed to be on an overseas trip, walked in with an unfamiliar woman. Mother-in-law looked shocked. Jackson, why are you here? And Olivia? I got a call from Sophia this morning saying she wasn't feeling well, so I came back. Then I got a call from kindergarten saying no one picked up Emma. If you have a problem, take it up with mom. If you have a problem, take it up with me, mom. Why are you being so mean to Sophia? As for the woman called Olivia, I was asked by you to come over, ma'am. Today was supposed to be Emma's violin lesson. She looked uncomfortable and apologetic. I was glad Jackson was back, but I was so feverish and confused that I passed out again. When I came to, a meeting was being held. At the in-law's house, Jackson and even father-in-law, who seemed to have left work early, were all gathered to get an explanation. Emma had gone to the park with Olivia, and the detailed explanation and discussion began. Mom, when I rushed home earlier, Olivia was outside, and inside you were shouting nonsense. What's going on? Explain. Mother-in-law began her story, looking intimidated by Jackson's stern gaze. While I was hospitalized for chemotherapy, she unexpectedly met Olivia, who was supposed to be abroad as a violinist. Olivia had returned after a hand injury ended her violinist career. Now, after surgery, she's a violin teacher. So why was Olivia at her house? When Jackson asked, mother-in-law said, I thought she could teach Emma the violin. I mistakenly got the dates mixed up. I thought you should have married Olivia. She'd be a good mom for Emma. What? We've been just friends since childhood. It's ridiculous to even suggest that when Sophia is here. But I just want you to be happy. Sophia's diagnosis is terminal. When she's gone, you'll be left to raise Emma alone. Olivia has always liked you. She's adored Emma and would gladly accept her. I thought it would be a good start with lessons. Are you kidding me? What do you think you're doing with our lives? I'm happy with just Sophia and Emma. Why can't you understand that? Don't drag Olivia into your crazy plans. You're out of your mind. Children aren't tools. And where were you? What's this? He held up several funeral home brochures. Mother-in-law tried to explain, but it was clear she had been planning my funeral. The realization that she despised me that much was more terrifying than sad. I can't stand you anymore. You're a terrifying woman. Wait, it's common to plan funerals while still alive. That's for people who are truly at the end. Sophia is fighting hard to live. I heard you said terrible things to her earlier. I've had enough. This is the end of for us. 
Father-in-law's words left mother-in-law speechless. We were shocked to hear that father-in-law intended to divorce, but he seemed resolute. Later, we got the full story from Olivia. Apparently, mother-in-law had been scheming to marry Olivia to Jackson. According to Olivia, mother-in-law had painted me as a terrible mother who neglected her child. To be honest, after hearing that from ma'am, I thought maybe I should become Emma's mother, but after spending time with Emma and hearing her talk about Miss Sophia, I realized she wasn't the person I'd been told about. I felt Emma's love for Mrs. Sophia. I too had been devastated when I couldn't be a violinist anymore due to my hand condition. Despite your severe illness, you're enduring painful treatments and raising your child without complaint. You're incredibly strong. Hearing Ma'am's cruel words earlier broke my heart. I won't see Ma'am again. Emma's only mother is you, Mrs. Sophia. I wish you all the best. I had been jealous of Olivia thinking she was mother-in-law's ideal daughter-in-law, but she was a dignified and beautiful person who, like me, had faced and overcome illness. After a discussion, we prepared to leave the in-law's house. We're leaving now. We won't see you again, Mom. Why is that? Why? How could she not understand after everything she'd done? Please, Sophia, convince Jackson you can stay at our, as our daughter-in-law. What? No, thank you. I refuse your permission to stay as your daughter-in-law. Goodbye. We left without looking back. Later, we heard father-in-law and mother-in-law did get divorced. Mother-in-law quickly signed the papers and moved back to her parents' house, but was soon kicked out. We heard from acquaintances that she was confident father-in-law would come back for her, but he never did. Mother-in-law had been spending excessively, mostly on supporting stage actors, and father-in-law had reached his limit. Word spread about mother-in-law's cruel words to me in her attempts to marry Olivia to Jackson. Many distanced themselves from her. She was evicted from her parents' house and now lives in an apartment working part-time. Having never worked and being so proud, this must be humiliating for her, but it's her own doing. I can't forgive her and hope she struggles. Jackson isn't an object just because he's her child. He has his own life, and his happiness isn't for mother-in-law to decide. If she had understood that, none of this would have happened. Mom, look, Emma's grown so much. Years later, we stood at my mother's grave, with Emma, now in elementary school, praying beside us. I was given six months to live, but I've survived for five years since. My cancer has metastasized to my bones, but I'm not afraid. I'm determined to live with my beloved family. I won't give up on holding my grandchild, a dream my mother couldn't fulfill.